Hi, thank you so much for tuning in to Woodstock Community Television. I'm Nikki McCallum. We're here on day three of the Vermont Film Festival. So excited to be joined by the one and only Zach Van Eck, who is the writer, director, and co-producer of the feature-length film, The Hitchhiker Effect, which I saw last night and loved. Thank you. So excited to hear a little bit more about this film, and I love these these postcards, the, the hitchhiker effect. Now you've got, um, so, so the log line, so a beleaguered conspiracy theorist in a contentious relationship struggles to understand the reality of paranormal events that begin when his eccentric neighbors drop by and refuse to leave. How did you come up with the idea for this film? First of all, I wanna say uh, greetings from Woodstock. Uh, Woodstock, Virginia. Virginia, not uh, Vermont. <laughs> yeah, this is where we shot the film. Um, back, I was a reporter in uh, the 90s for the Deseret News in Salt Lake City, and prior to that, I had been a reporter in Santa Fe, New Mexico for the New Mexican, and had done, uh, early 90s, there were a lot of, uh, there was a big UFO flap, a lot of cattle mutilations, and I was an investigative reporter, and so I went out and covered all that, and, you know, it was really interesting, and did a lot of research, and learned really about stuff that was going on in Utah, too, so when I got the job at the Deseret News in 94, I told my editors, uh, and this was a, um, newspaper that's run by the LDS Church, and I always thought, well, I've heard, you know, they're kind of open to the idea that maybe there's life elsewhere, right? So I said, hey, you know, if you guys uh, need me to go cover UFOs, uh, I'm sure there's some activity here. Uh, so it took two years, but uh, before they finally came to me, and it was the summer of 96 when Independence Day was coming out. And in the meantime, I just, on my own interest, I had uh, befriended the uh, the head of MUFON there locally, uh, Mildred Beasley. She was like in her 80s at the time. And I would, I covered some of the local communities and I would stop by on the way back and just talk UFOs with her and stuff. And there was a book called The Utah UFO Display that came out in 1975, written by Frank Salisbury, who is a professor at Utah State University. And he passed away recently, but he revised it. And I highly recommend it. Uh, the Utah UFO display, and it was all about the Uinta Basin in eastern Utah and all the UFO sightings wow. they had. Uh, junior Hicks, who also has passed away recently, lived into his 90s, great guy. He was the local junior high science teacher, and everybody who saw something came to Junior and told him about it, and then Frank got with Junior and, and just wrote all about it, and, and Junior had made little models of the UFOs. That book, basically, the, there were 400 sightings that they talked about from 70 to 75, and seven of them involved people seeing either creatures or people or humanoids or something uh, in the portals of ships or on the ground or something to that effect. So I was really intrigued by all that. So when my editors finally came to me two years after I'd been there covering local government and said, hey, why don't you look into the UFOs and, and we'll just do a fun, bright, you know, uh, to go with Independence Day. So then I went out to the Uinta Basin and I met Junior Hicks and I had already had lunch with Frank and everything before um, and spent a couple of days out there. and. Gina was great, and he gave me some contacts, and I talked to a lot of people who had seen UFOs in the 70s, and I was about ready to leave. And I called him back, and I said, Junior, you know, this is great, but I can't believe that the activity has just stopped, right? And I don't have anything current. You know, is there really anything going on currently? Yeah. And there was a long pause, and he said, well, you might want to call Gwen down at the bank. Uh -oh. So I called Gwen Sherman, and... Um, and I, like I said, I, I covered UFOs and cattle mutilations. I had a list of, in New Mexico, I had a list of like 14 sources and wow. stuff. And her husband, Terry, I mean, they were just going through this nightmare for two years. And they were sitting on their porch and seeing these like windows open up in the sky, a portal or, or a cloaked ship or something, and these other ships coming out and uh, uh, shining a red beam on the ground as if they were like like a grid pattern, like they were exploring something. And, and Gwyn was chased by these little red orbs, and um, oh my they saw Bigfoot and cryptoids and just all this bizarre stuff. Yeah. So I broke that story in uh, June 30th of 96, and actually won a award from the um, uh, Fund for UFO Research, which paid wow. for our swamp cooler, which was great, because it was about to hit summer and we had no air conditioning, so that was great. That's awesome. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I've, I've written a story, um, a script ab about that original experience because the Shermans can't tell their story anymore. They signed a non-disclosure agreement when Robert Bigelow bought the property and set up the National Institute for Discovery Science. Oh, wow. And Bob actually offered me a job, but my wife said no, so we didn't take it. And I'm glad I didn't go that route. But anyway, <laughs> so I have that original script that I finished in 2003, and I... I've got a really good agent now, but I can't seem to get him interested. Um, the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, has been on the History Channel for five years now. So wow. 
Uh, so I was like, well, you know, I don't have the money to do that script yet. Yeah. But what I can do is focus on the hitchhiker effect, which is a very real thing. It yeah. didn't happen to me. I wasn't out there long enough. But the people who've gone out there and worked for Bigelow and the people who are out there now with the TV show, they've had that issue where if you're exposed to the paranormal activity, it tends to follow you home or wherever you are. And, and they've had, there was a government scientist who allegedly, this is reported, um, you know, went home and, and there was like a werewolf in the type thing, dire wolf in the backyard or whatever. And, and they've seen dire wolves or, you know, yeah. seem to be prehistoric wolves. So the hitchhiker effect is a thing. So I thought, okay, look, uh, I got this cabin that my um, uncle bought in 1969, which I was now living, because I was in LA from 2007 to 2019. But for two years, I didn't meet anybody new. I was working with the same producers, mostly for free, mostly yeah. on spec. Mostly they were unsuccessful. So uh, I'm, why am I paying $1,500 rent? <laughs> so I went yeah. home. And my mom had met this guy and moved out anyway and didn't have any, uh, anybody to take care of the cabin. So I moved to the cabin in 2019 and then the pandemic hit, which yep. was a good place to be. And then um, We Make Movies, which is a filmmaking collective where I met our three, three of our lead actors uh, 15 years ago. Wow. They had a contest uh, uh, to shoot a film under $25,000. And so that, that was, again, this is about three years ago. And Michael and I talked about because he's a, a member of We Make Movies as well. And I was like, okay, I, I'm going to do something. So I wrote The Hitchhiker Effect, uh, got rejected by my own group. Uh, but I'm like, that's okay too. I think I'm good. And then... Mm -hmm. The micro-budget agreement, which sag After did not right. have seven years ago when I did a lot of new media stuff, but now it's available. And it basically says that if you can keep your budget under 20000 and you can use union actors and pay them whatever they agree, uh, you, can't, um, you can't distribute it commercially until you pay them what they really would have made. So we do owe the actors about $6,000 total, okay. and that includes the P&I in order just to get distributed. But for me, I was like, well, what if our movie sucks? That you know, We don't want to go with the UPA budget, which would have been a lot more expensive. So yeah. anyway, so that's, that's where we're at now. I'm, I'm very happy with it. I love my actors. My DP, Sarah Bravo, was awesome. She had done uh, Sweet Caroline for me seven years ago. I was so, so cool. happy that she did this for me. Um, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Samantha, plays a role in this. And, I'm, and she was very nervous about it, but she is so good. And my mom's also in it. And my mom's boyfriend is in it, and plus he, um, his voice anyway, and uh, he gave us the car, the, the picture car, because he has a lot of I classic love that. cars. So, there and you go. And you also were sharing with me earlier that you're an astrologist mm, yeah, as yeah. well. And so how did that, you mentioned that played a role in, in your shoot Sure dates. did, sure did. So we shot um, April, the second week in April, uh, 2023. Okay. And uh, I looked it up far in advance, because you don't want to shoot uh, during Mercury retrograde, and you don't really want to be preparing during retrograde either so we had to skip that and then i was looking at just a lot of factors mostly and and i looked at all the astrology for myself and the actors because i had i don't think i had john's chart but i have everybody else because i that's pretty that's much wild. what i do and I, when i was in la i was like oh i'll do a chart for you. you know i've done like 300 readings for free I'll just do it for, i'll do one for you after perfect i can't <laughs> wait i, can I was hoping on, you'd say i that. can do it on my phone <laughs> um so anyway so i planned it all with astrology and it did work out great but what i didn't you know i was raised presbyterian but i you know it was Easter week and I had no idea. <laughs> and so to fly everybody out from LA um, probably cost us about 2,000 more than it should have. I know. Um, yeah, but you know, I'm glad that it happened that way because it was a perfect week and it went well and uh, I, we couldn't have asked for anything better. In fact, I don't, I don't know if I can do any better on that budget. I, I mean, you know, it just, and the actors are fantastic, but yeah, we're, it cost us money, it worked out well. One thing that uh, kind of saved us that 2000 was uh, Marlon Clark, who I love, was gonna play the role of Jane. And um, also from LA, met her at We Make Movies, and she was going to come out. Um, but she had a ticket to a sci fi convention or something, I think, and, oh, wow. and couldn't do it. Um, so I was kind of desperate about six weeks before because uh, I really wanted a minority actress. And, I, and I'm in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, and a lot of minorities. And so I was looking at uh, backstage, and I found Laverne who had done some uh, some theater but never done film. And she lives in Murraytown, which is the post office where I get my mail. It's like she's wow. 13 minutes from the set. So I got a hold of her, and I was going to hire her no matter what. But she came over, and um, she's great. And you cannot tell that Laverne is not from L.A. 
and is not one of the experienced LA actors. She was awesome. She in was this. great. And so, uh, so happy. And so we didn't have to fly her out. And actually, we, we didn't have to pay her because she's non-union. And that really helps when it comes to trying to upgrade to a UPA because they only have three actors now that I have to pay. And we do right. have a distribution deal on the table. Oh, congratulations. Uh, I want to thank my agent. Well, yeah, um, Freestyle Entertainment. But I don't know if we can go with it because uh, I got to pay the 6000 And then we need, you know, clearance, which shouldn't be a problem. But they're going to charge you the same amount as anybody else because we're really careful. You know, yeah. there shouldn't be anything and there's there shouldn't be any conflict. Um, and then captions. So it's like another 9000 And, uh, you know, the distribution deal is, you know, they're going to take 15000 And right. I'm like, well, I don't think I'm going to make much more than that. So we may try to self-distribute or we may wait. Um, uh, sag after has been great. They said, you know, if you want to do this in two years, you can do it. So I would hope, but, but we've decided to kind of, at this point, extend our festival run a little bit more, which allows me to, because I lived all over the country, so I'm going to apply to the uh, the Anchorage Film Festival because I went to high school in Anchorage. Oh. We're about to hear from Portland. I went to U of O. I finished up at U of O. I went to Vanderbilt for two years, Nashville, so I've, I've and worked in New Mexico, so I, so it's kind of fun. It's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, let's just let's just go to the festival run because that's a little bit less expensive than than nine thousand dollars to get distributed. But I think it'll happen at some point. I'd like to do that that's and so see what exciting. we do get from it. I just like I just want to get twenty thousand back so I can make another film. We were ready to shoot in October. Our next yeah. one is the Love Machine. It's great. It's in fact, it's going to star Michael and Allison, the same two that Very started this. Cool. And Michael is going to play an android. And basically, it's um, Allison's character's father, who is going to be the guy who played Seth, uh -huh. John Bigham, right? He's going to be the mad scientist. Uh, anyway, so he's like, um, his daughter has is, is only had uh, first dates their whole life. So he's like, okay, I'm going to create, you know, we're testing out a prototype and test this robot. And, he, and he's like tweaking the personality every time. So Michael would get to play a character that basically has five different personalities, which actors usually love, right? Super and, cool. And, you know, you saw his work. He's just dynamic. He's fantastic. And Allison is amazing. Oh, my God. So, yeah, I, I would make ten movies with the same people if I could. I mean, they're really good. So, so we want to awesome. do that. I just want to make enough money back to shoot another one. Well, you know, I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for you. <laughs> Before you. we wrap up, I'd love to take a look at, at a clip from The Hitchhiker Effect. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't believe aliens are here. I know aliens are here. Alan is a researcher, an independent UFO researcher. Why, why are you so dead set on telling the world about these aliens anyway? Keeping me silent about their presence is what this is all about. It's why neighbors we've never seen before show up out of nowhere and won't leave. How do we get rid of frickin' Seth and Jane? You don't like to have fun, do you, Mr. Grumpy Buttocks? <laughs> Once and for frickin' all. Perhaps you haven't noticed the uh, poltergeist activity? There's no such thing as ghosts. We're no strangers to the plant show. This is getting creepy, Alan. They're never going to leave me alone. Don't you just love that tingly feeling? Clectu Murata Nikto. You've got an agenda. And until I can figure out what it is, get out of my house! You can't believe everything you think. Awesome. Zach, thank you so much for coming in today. Again, so very loved your film, and I can't wait to see what, what's in store for you next. I just want to say, if anybody uh, wants to make an inexpensive film in Woodstock, Virginia, give me a call. We can make one for $20,000. Uh, <laughs> there know, you go. I'll write the script for you. So. Awesome. Zach, so great spending time with you. Thank you.